So those of you who don't know me, I'm Paul. I'm the Managing Director of MAP and we provide uh, full finance functions on an outsource basis specifically for digital agencies. And uh, I partner with Adam, Wave Adam, guy in the purple top, Steve, Mike. <laughs> um, uh, and that's it. Yeah, so we, we set up the Bulletproof Agency Network because we're four different um, professional service organizations that focus on the digital creative sector. So we just want to use our combined knowledge and combined networks to be able to give as much value as we can to you guys in whatever way that we can. Um, and that involves uh, events, which we are very much missing and can't wait to do again and get you all uh, in person uh, in, in Manchester or, or or somewhere not too far before long. Um, and since lockdown, we've just been running similar events, but, but through webinars. And we very much want to shape these on kind of what you want to hear about. I think it's getting more and more difficult now to run webinars because like everyone's running a webinar on everything. So we want to try and make things that are as practical and tailored to what you want to hear about and, uh, and not too long winded either because we're very conscious of your time. So we've got two speakers today, which I'll introduce shortly, uh, but we just wanted to try, uh, we tried this last time, we're gonna do it again today, which is just kind of a bit of a sector update. Um, no more than 90 seconds, Mike, um, on what, what's kind of happening in our sector that might be relevant, might be useful to you. So I'll kick us off and then we'll move around, Mike, Adam and Steve, and then we'll start with the speakers. So for me, uh, so as I say, we, we, we run finance functions for an accountancy firm fundamentally. Um, the the C bills and bounce back loan schemes are coming to an end shortly. So C bills ends on the 23rd of September and bounce back on 4th of November. If you've not already secured funding for your business, um, I'd urge you to think, um, think uh, very seriously about applying for funding. I think in Britain in particular, we, have, we seem to have an aversion of, of taking on debt, which I completely understand, but there's never been a better funding available than, than, than what's available right now. And usually you've got the question of, do I want to pay for the cost of servicing that debt and what am I going to spend it on? At the moment, you've not got any of those questions because it's going to cost you nothing and you don't need to spend it. Uh, you can put it in a bank account for 12 months and then make a decision after that point whether you want to pay that money back or not. So um, fantastic deals that are available. Since the schemes started, they were they were originally with the traditional mainstream banks. There are now a lot more alternative lenders on the market. So if you have struggled with your existing bank, there are alternative ways of doing it. And there's also alternative products. Uh, invoice finance, for example, um, is now possible through a C-bill scheme. So you could effectively have 12 months of invoice finance, which means all, all or some of your invoices could be financed. Um, I've got a little Q&A that I did on this recently that I'm going to share, just kind of challenging some of the, the negative connotations that people have on invoice finance, but it's a very much a changed world in the last few years. It's far more flexible, far simpler than it was before, and you've got the option to fund your invoices for, for free for the next 12 months. It's something you definitely consider and have a chat with us if, if there's any interest on that. We've noticed some of the banks have started to be more flexible in terms of overdraft deals and offering really good deals and overdrafts as well as an alternative for C-bills. So that's something worth looking at. And then our big campaign at the moment is this leave no business behind campaign. So clearly some businesses have been affected more than others. Um, if you're one of those that has not been affected as much and would like to offer your support, yeah. offer to volunteer to speak to other agencies who are potentially um more affected than, than please let us know and for those that are affected we want to help you to uh, model your cash flow for this this period because early next year you're going to be hit by double personal tax bills in january because july got deferred shit isn't it double vat bills in march <laughs> it is a bit shit yeah who was that <gasps> um double vat bill uh, next march as well so uh, we want to help you to make sure that you, you're putting the, the right amount of money aside, but also that you've got a model that you can work with as things start to change because we, we, none of us have got a crystal ball. So that's what we're working on at MAP at the moment. If any of that um, is interest or if we can share any more, then, then please reach out and let us know. Uh, Mike, do you want to go next? 
Not really. Um, hi, I'm uh, Mike, Risk Parks. We do commercial insurance, really exciting stuff. Um, and all I was going to talk about quickly, um, very quickly, is um, something that people keep raising at the moment, which is how um, the current COVID situation affects both employers and public liability insurance. Um, we get quite a few of these queries. And the good news is generally, generally it doesn't. So within your insurance policy, um, you are covered for injury to employees under employer's liability or members of the public under public liability. And within the definition usually of injury is disease. And that's where the COVID stuff is generally picked up. Now, what we're seeing is we're seeing insurers are applying exclusions for COVID, but they're generally only apply to other types of insurance. So it'll be on the, the property and the business interruption and stuff like that. And they're generally specifically stating that those clauses, those exclusions do not apply to employers and public liability, which is obviously good because the those policies will be there to protect you should someone allege that they have caught COVID as a result of, of how you've run your business. Um, I would suggest that obviously you would check your clauses and stuff as, as things change because this is actually quite a moving, moving area. And we are seeing a few um, conditions applied. So we are seeing a few things about um, making sure that personal protective equipment is, is available. Um, we expect other sort of risk management clauses to follow in due course, um, but at the moment it's quite, quite lax. All we would say is that you have a duty to act reasonably. So as you bring people back to, to, um, to the agency office and so forth, obviously you need to do the best that you can, as I'm sure you will do, to make sure people are able to come back safely, socially distance and so forth. Um, so obviously that's not insurance, that will be the different risk management things you put in place. Um, and if you do not know anyone who, who does that stuff, give us a shout, because we know people who specifically do this already for, for um, agencies, which is nothing to do, of, of, again, with insurance. But the key message there is that at the moment you are still covered under employers and public liability should someone catch COVID as a result, allegedly, of your actions. However, keep an eye on it. That's got to be close to 90 seconds, surely. It's also worth just saying, guys, that um, we're going to cover quite a bit today. So if there's anything that you think you would like us to provide more information on, just drop it into the chat and I can make sure that we reference it in our follow-up email. Adam, do you want to go next? Yeah, go for it. Uh, I'll try and do nine seconds. Um, so I'm Adam uh, Caroline, Managing Director of Zentum. I usually bore people about talking about financial planning and the importance of having a financial plan for business owners. What I'm going to talk about today is I'm not going to get technical. I'm going to give you a really cool trick. So most of you guys will have a business plan. Hopefully if you work with guys like Paul, you'll have a business plan. So you'll have values, you'll have goals, you'll have risks, you'll have opportunities. You can use exactly the same format to bring across to your personal finances. So build a one page financial plan. I've, I've got one I can send you. If you, want me to, if you want to email me, I can send it across, but just map it out on one page and you, and you can also use it for your business. Don't underestimate the, the power of just having everything that's important written on one page. I literally have it in front of me now in my office. So I know that the decisions I'm making are in line with my goals and, and my values. So if you want a copy, let me know. Um, but hopefully that's useful. Cool. Uh, I'll provide you the contact details then I'm probably the best way to do it in email. Thanks for that. Steve's still working on his virtual background, but here he is. Sorry. Yeah. Um, all sorts of problems with the virtual background. So uh, 90 seconds. Um, just remembering what Mike said, insurance is a really interesting topic at the minute. And there's actually a test case um, being heard this week about how business interruption insurance works or doesn't work. So it's going to be really, really interesting to keep your eye on because there's an awful lot of chatter around agencies we know are saying that, you know, not, not if they would deal with Mike, they've got insurance that doesn't apply and that they can't rely on. So that's going to be fascinating over the course of the next few days. Uh, echoing what Paul said on funding, that, that's entirely right. You know, the funding's there, you should take advantage of it. The furlough scheme is changing. But zooming out a little bit to a macro level, we're seeing an awful lot of agencies as we were last month spending this time to try and get their processes a bit tighter. 
to get the right kind of agreements in place, um, to think about what the basic stuff that needs to be on the website, like terms of use and a privacy policy. We've been doing an awful lot of that. There is some M&A going on, uh, fairly surprisingly, in the sector. We're acting a couple of deals at the moment, that, and that's uh, that's encouraging to see. So on the horizon, uh, there's two things I think you need to be aware of. One is the fact that the ICO, so that's the Information Commissioner's Office, was having a look at digital marketing very closely. Um, that probe has gone on hold, but it's going to start against shortly. Effectively, they said that the digital marketing ecosystem has got six months to put socks up over real-time being problematic and consent. So I expect that's kicking into gear again relatively shortly. So think about how you use data, you know, whether it's first, third, second, third party, and how that fits in your business models worth thinking about. Uh, also worth having an eye on is the fact that the UK is going to try shortly to regulate the web and regulate social media through the online harms uh, regulation and the online harms bill that's going to come to uh, come to force. Well, we thought it was going to be this year, but it might be next year now. That, much like GDPR, is going to create a brand new duty of care for any business or organisation that has an online component to take active steps to reduce harm to its users. And what that means still remains to be seen. But we're seeing a lot of chat about it over the course of the past few days on disinformation, fake news, and just the same way as you've got to treat personal data as a risk now, you need to, uh, to uh, treat harm to users in the same way. And it could change an awful lot of bills. It could change a lot of relationships with clients. Uh, other than that, very much business as usual. We're seeing fewer contracts uh, on pause at the moment, and it looks like the world's starting to wake up again. So we can only hope that's right, and we're obviously really excited to see you all today, and we hope that you get some value out of the conference. Cheers, Steve. Yeah, so on that note of um, green shoots that everyone's talking about, and uh, certainly the, the the view in in the community that, that we run has been that it's perhaps not been as bad as people anticipated at the start of lockdown, which is great. We're starting to see positive signs of um, projects coming back on the radar now and, and even new business being won. So we wanted to have a focus on new business this month. So we've, we've, we're delighted to have Ben Potter with us. Ben will uh, um, share his screen in a second. He's going to run through his presentation. Ben's had 14 years in agency business development. He's an advisor, mentor, and non-exec, and he's on a mission to help digital agencies win the right type of clients. As well as work with agencies, he writes for e-consultancy and deal masters magazines, and he's been acknowledged as one of the UK's most influential business developers in the drums BD100. Um, one of the things that Ben's going to share today at the end of the presentation, which I thought was really interesting and, and, and uh, really good for you to all be able to screen grab, or obviously we'll send the presentation after it anyway, um, was, was about a, a, a process for discovery and qualification. So he points out that 80% of sales opportunities are lost due to lack of process. And he's going to show his process for working people through that filter. So Ben, if you're okay to share your screen and I'll meet myself and it's all over to you. Lovely. Thank you very much. Bear with me for one moment, folks. Yeah, that's worked. Good. Excellent. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you uh, to Bulletproof for uh, uh, first and foremost having me. Um, yeah, just, just to build a, a little bit on the background um, uh, from Paul, uh, I spent around about 14 or 15 years uh, working in digital agencies in a business development uh, capacity. The last three or four has now been using that experience uh, to, uh, to advise agencies on how to go about um, ultimately winning uh, the right clients. Um, hopefully, the Candy and Unicorns references uh, will make uh, will make sense in a moment. But um, I'd like to start off with a with a big fat uh, stat. Um, hopefully, if uh, this works, there we go. Um, I, I think I think the, the 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 challenges that agencies face are pretty pretty wide ranging, particularly um, in recent uh, in recent months. But Business development is always up there. Um, and in fact, um, according to uh, the WOW Company's Bench Press report, um, if you're not familiar with this, go and have a look at it. Um, it it's an annual survey, you can take part, and it bench, uh, benchmarks a whole range of um, uh, agency related stats from finance to operations. Uh, but the bit that, of course, really interests me is around business development. Um, and um, at the last time of running the report, 44% of agencies named uh, business development as their number one challenge. And that actually increased 
uh, from the previous year. I suspect if you were to run that again right now, um, maybe that stat would be would be even greater. Um, what really interests me is 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 why I think we we all know as business owners that winning new work is the lifeblood uh, of our business. Um, if that is the case, um, why do so many of us find it a, a struggle? Why is it a, a, a challenge for so many of us? So. Having spent around about 17 years working in um, and around agencies, I've kind of began to notice some uh, recurring themes, patterns, and I've kind of boiled it down to there being uh, kind of four really kind of root causes, as it were, as to why agencies tend to struggle uh, with business development. And I think maybe in recent months, COVID-19 has probably uh, shone even more of a light on, on some of these. Um, so I'm going to talk about those four root causes, um, but I think more importantly, what I hope to be able to give you today is, is practical advice that you can take away, um, that if any of those challenges should resonate with you, uh, advice that you can take away and actually start applying uh, tomorrow. So root cause number one, here's your unicorn uh, reference, um, a relatively easy one to start off with. Um, it's an unerring belief in, in quick fixes, shortcuts, uh, silver bullets or uh, unicorns uh, when it comes to uh, business development. So I think as, as humans, we, we kind of love the idea that uh, one thing will solve our problems, cure our woes or, or kind of make things better. It's kind of this idea of the, the classic kind of silver bullet. And I think we try and seek very simple solutions to sometimes uh, what can be quite uh, complex problems. Um, dare I utter the word Brexit? Um, I think the same can be true of business development. Um, because it is often undervalued or misunderstood, many believe the answer lies in a shiny new tool, uh, a piece of technology, um, maybe farming stuff out to a lead generation agency, um, even hiring a business development manager. All these things are often looked as being um, silver bullet. Um, the truth is, uh, and sorry to, to have to uh, 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 reveal this so early, but there are no shortcuts. There are, there are no hidden tricks or rabbits out of hats that I can give you today that you're going to be able to take away, apply tomorrow, and all of a sudden the problem is, is fixed. Um, it rarely comes down to one thing, no matter how big the change or kind of how large the, the investment. Um, just to kind of emphasize this point, um, and before I do so, just to say you can all have access to this presentation. As I go through, there are some links to some articles that build on some of the points that I talk about. So uh, there's some extra reading um, if you want to go away and do that. Um, but just to emphasize the point, um, uh, I'm not sure if you know who, who this chap is, uh, top marks if you do. Um, this is Dave Brailsford. Um, he was appointed the manager of uh, uh, Team Sky, the cycling team, back in 2010. This will make sense, uh, I promise. Um, he hasn't had the best press in the last year or two, but we'll put that aside for, for a moment or two. But he joined uh, Team Sky and brought along with him a strategy called the aggregation of marginal gains. Um, the theory was that if you could improve every area of cycling by 1%, um, those small gains would add, add up to a, a significant improvement. So he started by optimising or improving all the areas that um, even as cycling novices, you and I uh, could probably come up with. So the tyres on the bike, the helmet, the clothing, nutrition, um, that type of thing. But he then searched and went further than any other manager and started to try and optimise and improve areas that we would otherwise not perhaps think of. So um, things like um, the pillows that the cyclists were sleeping on, he would take those around to the various hotels so they got the optimum night's sleep. Um, he would take their own hand gel to avoid any risk of infection. Um, uh, particular massage gels that each rider would use um, and so on and so on. He said if we apply this theory of 1% improvement that uh, we win the, uh, win the Tour de France within five years, they actually went on to win it within three. Um, Dave also went on to manage the British cycling team in 2012 as well at the Olympics. I'm not sure if you can remember that, but we absolutely uh, kicked, uh, kicked ass in the velodrome uh, in 2012 as well. Um, I'm a really big fan of, 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 of the principle of marginal gains, and I think it perfectly lends itself 
to business development in the sense that it isn't one major change that's going to make the difference. It will be the culmination of, of, of dozens, maybe even hundreds of small changes you need to make in order to see that significant uh, improvement. So if you want to make business development uh, easier, uh, I think you first of all have to accept that it has to be designed with the same level of attention as any other part of the agency. I think agencies tend to be very adept at having very detailed processes around service delivery, account management, finance, that type of thing. But it's quite rare that I find going into an agency, they, they perhaps take business development uh, quite so seriously and with quite the level of robustness around process uh, frameworks um, and so on. But that's number one. Uh, root cause number two, why do um, agencies tend to struggle uh, with business development? Um, it's around positioning. Um, now this is, this is a biggie uh, and to be quite honest, I could talk around this uh, all afternoon. Um, it, it, it's the bulk of what I'm going to talk about today uh, because it is that important. I mean, if you were to imagine, or actually let's not imagine, let's uh, revel in my graphic design skills and actually look at a pyramid. If you were to imagine a pyramid uh, of business development, positioning would very much be at its base. If you want to be able to craft a more compelling, relevant proposition, if you want to make lead generation easier, if you want to have a framework by which you can qualify leads, it all goes back to, it all goes back to positioning. Um, but considering how fundamental it is, um, I tend to find it's an area that agencies really struggle with. Agency websites are, are littered with the same terms, words, phrases, often unsubstantiated claims. Um, this is the bit where uh, an audience tends to start thinking about their own website and starts to play a game of bingo with regards to how many of these terms tend to pop up on their website. Um, they, they kind of range from the kind of self-centered, uh, downright wrong uh, to kind of stating the, the bleeding obvious, if, if, if I'm being quite honest. So if we were to take just two or three, two or three of these as an example, um, uh, results focused. Um, if you're not focused as an agency on getting results for your clients, then you have to question why you're, why you're in business. Um, honest, because I love to do business with liars and charlatans. Um, if we look at um, uh, number one, this is one of those claims that we make that isn't supported by any data whatsoever. Award winning. Is there an agency that hasn't uh, won an award? And, uh, and don't get me uh, started on, on passionate. Um, it's not to say that these things are wrong, um, but it is to say they are wrong when they are considered to be a differentiator. Um, to be quite honest, uh, they're not because all agencies are saying uh, the same thing. These are bells and whistles um, at best. Um, and what we end up with as a result of this are thousands and thousands of agencies that essentially look and sound the same. I won't read this to you. I have um, exaggerated this um, slightly uh, in an effort to be, uh, to be uh, funny. Um, but the reality is there are an awful lot of agencies that actually, if you look at their proposition, it pretty much looks um, and sounds like this. Um, and what that means, of course, is that it is somewhat difficult for a prospective client to tell uh, one from the other. Um, and of course, what that means is that business development inevitably um, comes a bit of a slog because if everybody does look the same or if you are trying to target everybody how do you create a sales and marketing plan that is targeting everyone um, how do you qualify if a prospect is a good fit if everybody is considered um, to be a good fit how do you justify charging a higher price when there's seemingly no difference between you and 10 other agencies um, around around the corner so in my experience most generalist agencies, most agencies that say they are able to work with anyone and everyone struggle with business development for, for these reasons. Now, there are some exceptions to the rule. Um, I've spoken to dozens and dozens of agencies over the last few months, as you can imagine. Ironically, I say all of this, but ironically, the agencies that have tended to do okay through all of this have been those that have maybe got a broader spread across a number of, a number of different sectors. Um, but they do tend to be exceptions to the rule. And, and I think they tend to benefit from scale, size, reputation. But I think for smaller independent agencies, if you are going to stand out, um, you've, got to, you've got to narrow your focus. Otherwise, I do think you are going to experience some of the issues that I've talked about and will talk about um, today. Um, 
So um, having potentially uh, just uh, torn your agency uh, apart with regards to your proposition, I think it's only right that perhaps I provide some advice on how to actually go about addressing that issue if you do fall within the category of maybe being a little bit more generalist. Um, rather than specialist. Um, so in my experience, in, in, in kind of my opinion, um, when it comes to agency positioning, there are there are three things that uh, that uh, that mean good, if you like. Um, first of those, and I think probably the most important, is to be attractive to a specific audience. And and once you have done so, to focus much less on you and much more on the problems faced by that audience or the opportunities. Uh, they're seeking to exploit, uh, but also the outcomes that uh, that audience care most about. Um, when you claim to work with businesses of all shapes and sizes across all industries, it's impossible to appeal to all of them. And I think it probably lacks credibility. I've seen agency websites that claim to be specialists, but then they have 10 sector pages on their website claiming to specialise in each of those with a team of 10. Um, that just lacks credibility for me. Um, I think the reason why agencies tend to avoid narrowing their focus is, is, is through fear um, rather than what they may potentially gain by narrowing focus. And I also think it comes down to an assumption that you can only narrow your focus or be more audience specific by going down the sector route. Now, positioning yourself by sector is absolutely one way to go. And you can be an e-commerce specialist or a, a finance specialist, and, and, and absolutely, um, that is that is one way to go. But I think there are more creative means also of beginning to think about how you uh, become a little bit more narrow in who you are trying to talk to. So just to take a couple of these as an example, it might be that all of your clients target a particular demographic. There I use the term millennials or the over 50s, for example. It might be that all of your clients are on a certain uh, phase of growth. So maybe they're startups or scale ups or they're brands that are on the wrong side of 40 and need a bit of a reboot. Um, they could share similar objectives or aspirations. So um, David C. Baker, um, if you haven't heard of him, wrote an excellent book called The, the Business of Expertise. Um, he talks about trying to identify patterns of expertise by looking across your clients and identifying where those common traits are and then hanging your hat uh, on that with regards to how you narrow down uh, the audience. The second thing with regards to what good looks like is when an agency has a sense of purpose. Now, I'm not going to get into a conversation around um, uh, Simon Sinek and start with why um, and so on and so on. The only thing I would say is that if you're going to put purpose front and centre of your proposition, make sure it's relevant to the audience you're looking to attract. If you started your agency because you worked at a bigger agency, thought they were a bit crap and decided to set up on your own, that's fantastic. There is a sense of purpose there but I'd argue that isn't necessarily relevant to your audience. Whereas if you are a agency specializing in charity and you have, a, uh, you have worked in charity, you have a passion for charity, that really represents your why, then you're probably gonna put that more front and center. If your why isn't that strong, then I think at least stand for something, have a, have a point of view or have a perspective. And of course, this is easier once you've defined your audience. Um, if that's a little bit marmite, if it's a bit polarizing, all the better, because after all, we're trying to attract people that think and share the same point of view. It's, it's pretty fundamental to any relationship we have in life. And I don't think we should see agency and client relationships um, any different. Um, the third thing, and sorry, just to emphasize the importance of, of purpose, of uh, kind of values of culture, um, around 83% of buyers say that they're more likely to buy from a business whose culture, personality, values, and so on uh, marry up to their own. So this is this is clearly important stuff. The third thing is, uh, uh, and I've probably made this point already, uh, when we try and use more emotive, down-to-earth language, try and avoid the language of agencies. Uh, instead, focus on authenticity. Let your personality shine through. And um, I'd like to say I'm the first to say this, but um, I'm not. Uh, good old David Ogilvy. Uh, just uh, under 40 years ago, um, agreed with me, fortunately. So um, let's try and drop some of the language of agencies, because in my opinion, it has become somewhat uh, tired, overused, and therefore meaningless. Just to finish this section on positioning, if you haven't come across a guy called Tim Williams, 
uh, over in the US, um, Ignition Consulting, go and look him up, um, uh, does a lot of work around positioning, a lot of work around pricing. Um, and um, I just thought this was quite a nice uh, statement to finish this section. I won't read it to you, uh, but as I say, you will have the opportunity to read this back um, in your own time. Uh, number three, again, going back to our original question, why do agencies find business development difficult? Why do they find it uh, tough? Um, most agencies, certainly that I have started work with and talked to, tend to be on a perpetual cycle of feast and famine. Um, Busy one minute, quiet the next, um, and that can have a significant effect on, 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 on the team, on staff morale, um, and of course, uh, many a sleepless night as well. Um, now, if we go back to understand the reasons why, it tends to be due to a lack of consistency of lead generation activity. And it then means that revenue, profitability, and so on tends to be up and down um, like a yo-yo, or in this case, uh, a roller coaster. Um, and it's because too many agencies are reliant on whatever happens to come through the front door. And if we take that a step further, most agencies tend to be far too reliant on referrals. Now, referrals are great. Don't get me wrong. They're a sign you're doing a good job. Uh, the sales cycle is often much shorter. Um, you can, the, the close rate tends to be much higher compared to leads from, um, from other channels. But Referrals are also a problem if your agency is too reliant on them, and even more so if you're not taking a more proactive approach to how you go about um, increasing the quality um, and the, uh, the frequency um, of those leads. Um, again, if I think about the agencies I've spoken to in recent months, I think those that have been able to ride the storm um, uh, don't necessarily sit in this box. They uh, tend to invest in a broader set of lead generation uh, activity. Those agencies that perhaps suffered a little bit more um, have been traditionally far too reliant on referrals. They haven't really got a business development plan. They're almost having to start from five yards behind the, behind the start line with regards to getting that activity um, off the ground. Um, now, right at the beginning of the conversation, I said there were no silver bullets. Um, there are no magic formulas, um, but uh, there is. It's just not particularly exciting. Um, and it's this. Um, in theory, business development is actually very, very simple. Um, it really just comes down to doing enough of the right things consistently well. But importantly, always, even when you're busy doing other stuff, even when that big project lands, the agencies, in my experience, that are uh, more successful at negating some of the issues that we're talking about today have always got the tap on. They don't turn the tap off when they become busy. They keep the tap running. Even if it's just a slow trickle, there is always some business development and marketing activity um, underway. The peaks and troughs you may experience as an agency, if we trace that back, it's going to be down to a lack of consistency in ongoing uh, lead generation activity. If you want to make business development easier, first and foremost, don't rely on referrals. Um, you are effectively outsourcing your lead generation with referrals and there, you have no real control over the frequency, consistency and quality of those referrals. If you are going to do referrals, though, make sure you're taking a more proactive approach to how you are generating the quality um, and the frequency of those. And there's a link to an article at the bottom of this, uh, this slide um, on how to do that. Um, Take down your numbers. Now, what I mean by this is that at the beginning of the year, when you set yourself your business development target, it can look pretty scary. Um, the way to make things less scary is to break that number down into more manageable targets and even further break that down into actions. Now, when I say break it down into numbers, this is old school. I make no apologies for it, but it's really about trying to understand that if we're going to meet that big number, how many leads do we need at the top of the funnel? How many of those need to turn into qualifying calls and meetings? How many of those into qualified opportunities? And how many pitches and proposals do we need to do based on our win rate in order to ultimately get to our big number? As I say, this is old school. I make no apologies for it. But it's an effort of trying to break down the big number to make things feel more manageable and, and that little bit less scary. Have a plan. Most agencies I start working with do not have a business development plan. Um, vitally important. If you don't have a plan, as, uh, as, as the A-team know, it can't come together. So you've got to have a plan to begin with. 
Um, what I would recommend that you do is start small. Think about maybe two, three, four things that you can do well. Think about your target audience. Think about where they spend their time. Think about your time and resource. Think about the things that you are good at, that you like doing. And, and, and if we talk about consistency, put in place a plan where you can do those things on a consistent basis, regardless of how busy um, you become um, in other areas. And then finally, focus on action. Uh, this is inspired by uh, this book here. I'm not sure if anybody has read that, The 12 Week Year. Um, the principle of this book is that um, traditionally we tend to plan uh, uh, in 12 month cycles. And I think at the moment, doing that is even more difficult. Trying to anticipate where we're going to be in seven or eight months' time and have a really nailed down business development plan for what's going to be happening in January, February, March, I think is difficult at the best of time. So the whole principle of this book is first and foremost to work in 12-week chunks or three months or quarters, if you like. Um, but then the emphasis is really about taking action. So it's about setting a goal and then working out the actions that need to take place over that 12 week period, and then measuring the number of actions completed as a lead indicator rather than what we traditionally measure, which are uh, number of leads, sales, that type of thing. So it slightly flips things on its head by trying to look at lead indicators as opposed to lag indicators. Because ultimately, as they do say um, in the book here, um, you have greater control over your actions than you do your outcomes. You ultimately can't control the big number, so focus on the one thing you can control, uh, which are your which are your actions. Well, somebody, somebody not muted. I can uh, hear quite a lot of background noise. I'll sort it now, Ben. I'll find it. <clears throat> uh, thank you. Just have to scroll through. Sounds like there's some screaming kids in the background. <laughs> yeah. Can't see. If one, if one of here is muted. Oh. Daniel. Do you know? Are you just unmuting to tell me who it is, Daniel? Oh, I found it. There you go. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, and finally, back, back to our question. Why do agencies uh, find business development tough? Um, the reason, one of the reasons why I do what I do is because I believe there are kind of too many ingrained behaviours and processes that, that, that ultimately benefit uh, neither party. And I think none more so than the somewhat one-sided pitch process, um, where traditionally prospects tend to hold all the cards. Uh, we tend to bow to their every whim um, and request. We're petrified that if we challenge the process, um, or the brief will end up losing the business. Um, at its worst, uh, clients invite agencies to take part in a pitch process with no real intention of, of changing agencies, as, as one of my clients once called them, uh, they, were, they were pitch candy. Um, I think it's really easy in this instance to blame the, the prospect, but unfortunately, um, it's actually, in my experience anyway, down to the agency. Um, Again, going back to the stat that I think Paul shared with you earlier, uh, this is from a book uh, called Let's Get Real or Let's Not Play. Um, they say that around about 80% of lost sales opportunities are the result of a lack of a, a process or a, a non-existing uh, qualifying process. Um, if there is one, it tends not to reflect the very consultative nature of agency services. Um, instead, what I tend to find is that agencies and indeed clients are far too eager to get to the money shot, um, in other words, the proposal. And they're not prepared to take the necessary time and necessary steps to make sure that that proposal is right uh, when we get to that when we get to that stage. And it means that many hours are often spent uh, second guessing what we think the client wants um, rather than really establishing through the course of a process what they need. Um, so this is what a process should look like. It will probably make your eyes uh, bleed somewhat if you're trying to look at this on a small screen. Um, I will share this with you so you kind of look at it um, in your own time. But what this process is really saying is that qualifying isn't, what, isn't a one-off event. It isn't something that just happens at the start of the process uh, and then we move on to the proposal. Um, it's about 
uh, 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 having robust questioning frameworks to determine if the prospect is a good fit. Um, it's really about leaving no stone unturned to understand objectives, pain points, outcomes, et cetera, et cetera. And I think people look at this and assume it's going to take more time. Just as an aside, if anything, this kind of process should save you time because it should allow you to discard the wrong prospects sooner and instead spend the time on the right prospects that you stand a much better chance uh, of winning. So just to finish up and with this in mind, I'm just going to go through a few uh, kind of tactical tips, um, which are all about how you can kind of take control of the process um, and therefore lead to a, a better outcome, which is ultimately winning um, the right clients. Um, and as I say, also discarding uh, the, run, uh, the wrong ones much sooner. Um, a really simple one to begin with, but it doesn't happen often enough. Um, always agree the purpose of a meeting um, and send an agenda. And I think importantly for any meeting, um, uh, ask, the, ask the recipient to add to that. What would they specifically like to see at this first meeting? Don't just assume. I've made this mistake before. I've turned up to a meeting, haven't set an agenda, thought it was one thing um, and it was quite another in terms of what the prospect wanted to get from that particular meeting. Don't leave it to chance. Um, get rid of the creds. I, I, I don't like creds at all, uh, particularly when an agency walks into the room, gets their laptop out um, and starts talking about themselves. We tend to see it as a positive buying signal when our creds are requested. So if you're maybe nurturing a relationship and they turn around and say, yeah, send us over your creds, quite frankly, it's probably a polite way to tell you to bugger off. Um, I think in most instances we should avoid creds decks altogether, but particularly when you're turning up to a meeting, whether that's face to face um, or, or kind of virtual, don't start the meeting by getting out the creds and talking about yourself. Instead, lead a call or meeting with questions, uh, not statements. So in the past, people in sales had to, had to be adept at, at answering questions because they held all the cards. They had what's called an information advantage. These days, good salespeople are much more adept at asking questions to really get under the skin of the prospect, to really understand objectives, challenges, etc., and then be able to align their solution uh, to that. Um, if you ever watched uh, Mad Men, uh, how many times did Don Draper walk, walk into a meeting and absolutely smash it? Many a time, but there are also times when he walked into that room and his ideas fell flat on their face. And that's because um, he didn't pre-qualify his idea. So I have a view about uh, when you get to the pitch or the proposal, what you are putting in front of that prospect should be broadly what you have already agreed uh, verbally up until that point. I think in creative circles, this is called a tissue session. It's when you speak to the client in advance of the final pitch meeting and you talk through your initial ideas, you get their feedback so that you can do one of two things. You can either go back and refine that idea so that when you do land it at the pitch, it's absolutely on the money. Or if they say, yep, yeah, that sounds fantastic, you can progress with more confidence knowing that what you do put in front of them earlier is more likely to land. Always start your proposal uh, with a look to the future. Um, I once looked through an agency uh, pitch deck uh, a few years ago, a Brighton-based agency. I won't, of course, name them. It was 60 slides, not necessarily a, a crime in itself, but the first 40 were all about the agency. Uh, slide after slide after slide, a pretty mindless guff uh, about the agency themselves. And finally, later on, they started to address uh, the client. We should completely flip that on its head. The whole presentation, say 80% of it, should be about... Uh, that should be about the client. Um, the, the, the latter stages, the appendix, should be about the agency. Put all of that stuff in the back because by this point, they should already know you. They shouldn't have to hear about the stuff that they've probably already looked on the website, they've heard during the various conversations you've had uh, up until this point. But start the presentation by looking to the future. Show them what the promised land is going to look like and then explain how you're going to get there. Um, I live in a, a small village called Corn uh, in Leicestershire. Um, if I was to write that down for you, you'd be much less likely to remember that than by seeing uh, this image of a fox. My village is quite famous traditionally for its fox hunting. You are now far more likely to remember that due to a cognitive bias that says we are more likely to recall images than we are written text. So where you are trying to explain quite maybe complex concepts or ideas, 
Try, if you can, to use graphics or images. Uh, they are much more likely to be recalled uh, by your audience than, um, than trying to explain long concepts in paragraph and paragraph of copy. A personal pet hate of mine, always talk in terms of investment. Uh, if your proposal has a page on it and at the top it says costs, get rid of it. Costs is a negative. Um, investment at least is positive in the sense that it suggests if I'm going to invest some money, I'm going to get something back in return. Uh, keep your options to a minimum. Uh, I'm not sure if anybody's heard of a, a quite famous jam experiment. Uh, two stalls were set up. On one of those, there were 24 varieties of jam. Uh, on the other, uh, there were six. Uh, which do you think uh, sold uh, the most? Uh, we might think it's the one where there are a greater variety of jams. In fact, it was the one uh, that just had the six. Uh, the reason being is that our brains tend to freeze when we're presented with too many options. I like an ale and an IPA. Uh, it used to be easy going to the supermarket and making a choice. When you go now, my brain freezes because there are just too many options in front of me. And I've actually ended up walking out having not bought anything at all. Uh, we assume more choice is better, but it's not. If you are going to present choices, present three. Another cognitive bias would suggest that in most instances, uh, the, uh, the buyer will choose the one in the middle. Engineer that. Make the, the lower option the one that is not quite going to get to get them to where they want to get to. Make the higher option one that's probably a little bit out of the ballpark in terms of cost or investment. Um, and you will engineer a situation where they go for the option that you want them to choose. Um, in a competitive pitch, go first or last. This is another cognitive bias that says we recall uh, things that are either first and last in a sequence as opposed to those uh, that sit uh, in the middle. It is best to go last, but if you can't go last, engineer a situation uh, where you can go first. Uh, we're all having to adapt and do virtual pitch meetings. Um, so one way to, if you like, uh, address the room at the beginning, particularly if you haven't spoken to or met people before, is to ask each person specifically what they would like to get out of today's meeting. So that when you get to that relevant section of the deck, you can address that person and say, David, this is the point that we're going to talk about uh, the finances, for example. So you're making sure that whatever each of those persons would most like to get from the meeting, you're able to uh, directly uh, address those. And finally, uh, I try and avoid, uh, wherever possible, sending a proposal via email. Um, of course, we are not able to go out and pitch face to face in the way that we would want to at the moment. So the frequency of this has probably increased. Uh, but if you do have to send a proposal via email, if we're thinking about how we retain control, then just before you hit send, give the client or prospect a quick call and say, look, I'm really excited, just about to send the proposal over to you. But while I've got you on the phone, can we get a, a date and a time in the diary now by which we can uh, talk it through and gather your feedback? So what you're not doing is sending the proposal via email, rubbing your hands together, going job done, and then ending up chasing that person for weeks after, especially at this time of year when hopefully we're all able to get away uh, on a holiday or two. So again, it's just about trying to maintain that degree of control before you hit the send button. Just to wrap things up, Four things I want to leave you with. Um, stop looking for unicorns. Uh, building a sustainable and self-sufficient sales function, it takes time um, and it takes commitment. And unfortunately, in my experience, there are, there are no magic bullets. Narrow your focus. If you are falling into the category of being maybe a little bit too generalist, trying to be everything to everyone, I think you're going to find business development uh, even more difficult moving forward. Um, many of the problems I've described today are interrelated. If you have a problem with lead generation, then there's a high chance you can probably trace back uh, to an issue with positioning. Um, but I would absolutely urge you to think about your positioning and try and find a way of being a little bit more specific uh, to, uh, to a narrow audience. Make things happen. I think, you know, for a lot of agencies, pipelines in, in recent months have been decimated. And simply sitting there and waiting and hoping they're going to replenish themselves, uh, quite frankly, is a road to ruin. So you've got to make things happen. You've got to be proactive. You've quite frankly got to get off your ass and start being a, a lot more active in how you go about building and nurturing relationships. And finally, seek to control that process. Um, don't be led a merry dance by prospects. 
um, you simply can't afford to waste your time on people that are never actually going to invest uh, with your agency. Uh, and that's, that's me. Uh, if you want to look me up, uh, my details are there. Um, as I said to, uh, to Paul, I'll share this uh, deck with him and he can share it with all of you. Uh, there are some links to some articles in there for a bit of further reading. Uh, but I hope you found that useful. And um, thanks again for having me, Paul. Cheers, Ben. That was really good. And uh, like I said at the start, just good to help everyone start to get into the new business mindset as much as anything else. And I will share those slides uh, when we do the follow-up email. I'm going to get straight into Isla Slocks. I know many of you are looking forward to that, as am I. Um, so I want to allow her to, to crack on and get into things. So Isla, um, you've not got a presentation, which helps things. But uh, just as a quick intro, uh, Isla runs Ruby Star. They're a growth consultant, a lot of experience in helping agencies and professional service firms to grow, including Matt and no doubt some of the, the people that are on this call as well. Uh, and even better, speaking from the view of an accountant, uh, she does have access to some uh, EDRF support for, I think, Greater Manchester businesses, but um, Isla will explain further, and I think more than eight people as well uh, need to be in your company. Uh, but if you've got that, then you'll, you'll have uh, the potential to apply for some funding to give you access um, to the support of uh, Isla's company. Uh, and there's also independent chair and non-exec for, for a range of larger complex businesses as well. And she spent the last few months helping organizations work out how to rebuild, reopen, and not get back to normal, I think. Um, I hope I've done that just, justice, Isla, and over to you. Thank you, Paul. Um, and thanks, Ben, I re really enjoyed that. I'm gonna um, take your advice and spend no time giving my credentials. I'm gonna introduce myself <laughs> with a direct quote from your presentation. So I'm Isla, I'm the wrong side of 40 and in need of a reboot. I can see that some of you are too. Um, I, um, I wanted to, to talk to you today about this concept of getting back to normal, which we're all hearing a lot about. Um, and when I talk about these things, I tend to be quite blunt and I tend to talk in absolutes. So I want to give a tiny little health warning first. Um, some of the things I'm going to say are based on science and evidence. So you might disagree with them, but if it is your business to disagree with science, please take yourself to the comments in YouTube, because that's where that belongs. Um, some of it will be my opinion, and I would love to discuss that um, and argue it out with you. Um, but a lot of it will sound like it's aimed at people that aren't you. Um, so for the purposes of this presentation, if I say anything that makes you feel defensive, one of two things is happening. The first thing is that I may well be wrong. It has occasionally happened. And that's because you've got information that I don't have. But it also might be because I've said something that is true that makes you feel a little bit uncomfortable. And so I'd urge you for this presentation just to be in a mindset where if I say something and you get that little twinge, you think, what if that is true? what might that mean for my business? Um, because the most universal thing about our psychology is our ability to think that the things that we hear apply to everybody apart from us, and it creates some challenges. Um, I spend a lot of time working with um, founders and senior people in businesses, and I've done that for a number of years, and some of it's been quite successful, but none of the stuff I've been trying to get people to do has ever happened as well as it has happened during times of COVID. Um, so whilst there are huge downsides to that and lots which has been really difficult, there are absolutely some behavioural changes that we've all made that I think we need to take a pause and reflect on. Because everywhere I go, I'm having conversations with people about getting back to normal. And that makes me think two things. And the first one is, my God, normal is a low bar. Let's not aim there. And the second thing is, why? Why is normal where we need to get back to? Because I don't know how perfect your business was before or now, but I haven't yet met a business over the last few weeks who hasn't made some positive changes that they're at serious risk of undoing in this quest to get things back to how they were. Um, if I could sum up sort of the too long didn't read version of this presentation for those of you who want to, to drift off, um, before COVID, you were in the fucking way and you had to get out the way and that is brilliant. What I'd like you to do now is to think about how you don't get back in the way as we go forward. So just to give some examples of what I've seen businesses do and I, some of your businesses I've seen, some of them I haven't. 
I've seen a huge change in businesses finally trusting their employees and managing them by the outcomes that they get rather than the hours that they serve. And for some of us, that's freaked us out because we haven't been able to see what people have been doing every minute of every day. Some of us have got around that. We've got technology to do that for us. I'm not going to argue that that was a positive move. Um, but for a lot of us, we've suddenly had to focus on whether things are happening rather than how they're happening and who's doing them when. And that's something that we've all known for a long time we need to do. That means we've gone some way to breaking that presenteeism link that we all say we want to break. Um, I meet people every day who tell me that what they want most in the world is a really accountable team around them that can get on with stuff, get stuff done without interrupting them, without needing loads of support. And when I meet those people, I watch what they do. And I've been that person, I am that person. And I know that my actions don't support what I want. I know that I bloody love it when somebody asks me for help. That is my favorite thing. It makes me feel important. It makes me feel like I've got the answers. I love it when people need me because I'm a human and we all like that. And I feel a bit weird if I go away on holiday and everything runs without me. So even though I say I like that, I reward the people in my team who take most of my time and effort and I reward them with my time and attention. People who've met me might be surprised that my time and attention would be seen as a reward to anybody. But for all of us, if you are the founder of your business, if you're senior in your business, your time and attention behaves as a behavioral reward. That's how our psychology works. And if we really reflect, most of us can see that the employees and the partners and the suppliers that get most of our time and attention aren't necessarily the ones who are doing the things that we need them to do. Um, they're the ones that can take a tiny little problem and turn it into a crisis and suck us all in. They're the people who come to us with the sort of telltale and the gossip um, that gets us all excited and, and triggers all of our intrigue. And we very rarely do anything to reward the employees who do the thing we say we want, which is do their jobs, get on with things quietly and deliver the outcomes in the background. Um, over this period, founders have attended fewer meetings. They've done far less management by walking around. They've had to delegate things and they've had a type of communication that we all try and achieve when we're in our offices or our workplaces but we don't so this kind of um, quite focused communication where we have a little bit less small talk a little bit less social time that has a downside we miss that but in terms of the clarity of our communication it is much much easier if i'm on a zoom chat and i want somebody to do something i am much more likely to say to look at somebody in the camera and say ben i want you to call that client but do you know what we do when we're in a team meeting? We say, we need to call that client. We need to call that client. And then we get frustrated when nobody's called the client because we didn't tell anybody to do it. And worse than that, we might say it again. We might remind people and say, do you remember we said we need to call that client and follow up? And we think we've told somebody to do it again and we're cross because now we've told them twice, but we're still not told anybody. Um, and then eventually we get really pissed off and we go, oh, fuck it, I'll phone the client. And what we do there is create a whole series of pissed offness. We start ranting about how our team aren't accountable. And we train everybody in our business that the word we means I'll do it eventually if you ignore me long enough. If we had time, I could tell you a tragic and true story of the conversations that happen in my house every week about how everybody's going to tidy their room before I tidy everyone's room. But I'm sure we've all got versions of it. This form of really directive communication has benefits that we can take back so that we don't go back to normal, but we go back to better. We get ourselves out of the way. We get over our cowardice about asking people who we employ to do things. Um, I work with lots of people who tell me that the main problem in business is that they're too kind. And you know what? They are kind people, but the behavior that's tripping them up isn't the kindness, it's that they're chickens. Because um, we've all done that. We've all wimped out of a conversation if you've had any one-on-one -on -one conversations through this time of technology, it's really weird. It's, it's mad intense. You're seeing someone's face one-on-one -on -one, really close up. You're watching every movement of it. It does lead to greater intimacy. And that means that we are 
and, and the evidence supports this, having more direct, more honest and more constructive conversations with our team about what we expect of them, about their performance, about their behaviour. And some of that is going to go when we head back into an office. Um, somebody's just made a comment about how you find yourself being more of a boss and less of a peer. And, and I think that's true. And, and that's what you need to do. That is where you need to be to, to build my least favorite phrase for any business is open door policy. Open door policies were invented in an age where we had factories with an office at the top of the stairs and a, a manufacturing line down below. And it was created to solve the problem of people being too terrified to talk to the boss and alert them about major failings in either quality or health and safety. Unless you work in that context, shut your fucking door. Because I can guarantee that everybody who works for you has a hundred ways to interrupt your work to tell you things. And they're not afraid of doing it. Um, what they're not doing is solving their own problems because you love it when they ask you. Um, so I want to do something. I want us to all really have a little think. We're going to do a very, very rapid breakout. So you're going to be in a breakout room for um, five minutes, it's gonna feel really short, so it's rapid fire. What I want you to do in that breakout room with whoever's in it with you, is I just want you all to rapid fire, think about the changes you've made during this period and about whether any of those need to stay. And then most importantly, what will stop you keeping those things? What will cause you to backslide and dismantle all of these adaptive changes that you've made in your business? Paul, are you okay just to trigger the breakout room? I think so. I've got them all open here and I've got, it says a sign next to each one, which I don't want to do. I just want it to be automatic. So do yeah. I, is it so you create all rooms or? I can't see what you can see. If this doesn't work, we'll do it a different way. I've got recreate all rooms as an option. There's not like an obvious start button anywhere. Uh, if you press the sign, does it ask you to assign people or does it automatically assign? I have to assign, but it's all right. It only takes me a minute. I'll just do that. So I'll right. just do it alphabetical. So, so five minutes and just talk about the changes you've made and, and how you want to keep those to keep the improvements that you've seen during that time. Is it working Paul or should we do something else? I think so. I think it's working. I'll have a quick look in the chat and because some people have um, I really I identify that thing in the chat about feeling more of a boss and less of a peer and it is hard to stay in the loop um, but I think I think what you said is right it, it needs to happen um, the more you know about your team the harder it is to make strategic decisions um, and that sounds like a really blunt thing to say but if you know that what the business needs is this and what an individual needs is this you have to prioritize this and then handle individual consequences not shape your business around what you know um, and I think it's one of the it's it, you know as founders that's that's part of the downside but it's also a journey that i think we all go through several times as our business grows and gets more complex um just taking that step back being being the boss um sometimes i think the reason we don't want to do it is we know that when we're not there they talk about it's behind their back but they do that anyway they've already got a whatsapp group about you I guarantee it <laughs> <laughs> i literally had that problem this was it last week and I've caught up with one of the guys I'm closest to for dinner and then he like um we were talking about obviously lockdown and how things have been and I said oh I'm actually quite pleased with like how we've dealt with it as a business like not put anyone make anyone redundant not put anyone on furlough yeah he's like we've got a really close relationship he's my original employee and he's like yeah but don't you think it would have been better if we did put someone on furlough rather than us all having taken a cut and it just really hurt me because I was like, obviously I tried to do the best by everyone, but maybe our previous experience was we talk things out more as a team. So I think maybe he felt that difference of not having been involved in a decision. But at the same time, it was a decision that I'm really glad I didn't get everyone involved in because only I could have made that. So it's reassuring to hear that change and actually to think, you know what, that's, this is what everyone's going through in the boss landscape because I felt quite alone. Yeah, and you, that's the thing about being a boss, you, you are alone, you need to talk to other bosses <laughs> because you could have asked the team and they wouldn't have reached agreement and even if they'd made agreement, they still would have bitched behind your back. Um, and that's fine, that's part of how companies grow strong cultures is people having things to complain about. It's just that sometimes it has to be us. Yeah. Right, can, I, can I just give an instruction to everyone? So it's to, it, it, what, what is the instruction just so I can put it in the chat? It's to discuss. I want to talk about the changes you made during lockdown 
which of those you think you want to keep and what would stop you doing that. Um, so it's only a really short breakout, so, so talk about it fast, make sure everybody gets a, a chance if you can. Cool. Everyone's been assigned to one over anyway. Well, okay. <clears throat> so, um, in a well, what time are we now? So we're in sort of four-ish minutes. Yeah. Uh, will yeah. you just hit the button to call them back so we can capture some of that? Yeah, yeah. They've already been in for a, a couple of minutes as well, by the way. So. Okay. Sorry. So there's still okay. some people that are on here. Yeah, they must have just chosen not to go in, I think. Fine. If anyone's not been given the option to join a breakout room and you want to, just unmute yourself and let me know. wonder how many people are sat thinking like me. Is there really a WhatsApp group that exists just to talk about me? <laughs> I've got a colleague on the call, so I'm going to ask her. <laughs> she won't tell you. You know the um, answer to that question. I'm, uh, I'm in it, Paul. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> You're all in it. <laughs> I started, we were working with you, I started. No, <laughs> Ace. I, I think it's a really, I, I honestly think if you just accept that that's what's happening, you make better decisions because you realise you're trying to protect yourself against an unrealistic risk. Yeah. Well, it's, it's the conversation that's happening without you that Brian yeah. Solis talks about, isn't it? You don't need to be part of it, you just need to know that it's going on. Yeah, and not care about it. What are you keeping, Paul, when you come out of lockdown? Um, I, I think I've got a lot to give up, really. Um, pretty much every day I'm working out first thing in the morning and then spending a lot of time just out um, doing phone calls and getting fresh air yeah. as opposed to being stuck in meetings or stuck in front of my laptop, you know, go and grab a coffee, take my time, get some exercise, get some fresh air. So to have to give all that up and rush to get the morning train and, and go through all the rigmarole of, of a commute will be difficult. But I, I've been pushing for people to work remotely for ages. Yeah. But I, I, I recognise that uh, I think people in, in businesses start to worry about what their colleagues think about them not, not being in the office. And they even start to be bits of banter, like, you know, where, oh, I such such today, got the feet up at home again. I was like, that's not helping our push to get people working remotely. Um, it also, I think we can't do it unless we do it. So I think people watch what what the leaders of a business do and if they see you in every day they start to think yeah. well that's that's what's rewarded that's what's really you know we have this in the nhs a lot we've got lots of um lots of push for people to use digital technologies but some boards don't use it well the next level down then think well if board level people are important enough to meet face to face that's the behavior i need to model and that cascades through really fast it's it's, yeah. it's impressive how quickly people follow our example rather than our advice <laughs> yeah do you want to trigger them to come back in? Yeah, I've lost that option as well, so I'll just have to close them. Close them. That'll, that'll just give them a, a 60 seconds. Oh, it does give six seconds anyway. Yeah, yeah. I thought it, does, it was immediate, yeah. yeah. Doesn't just cool. give them out. It's a really short breakout room, but I think it just it breaks up a session a little bit. I'm going to just sort of sum up a little bit and get people to put some stuff in the comments and go as quickly as we can to questions. Is that all right? Yeah, of course it is, yeah.
give people a second to filter back in from there. Five minutes yeah. is nothing, is it? When you're in a breakout room, it's like that. It's just gone. Um, so I would absolutely love if anybody's willing to share any of the things that they want to keep in the chat, that would be brilliant. Um, do keep putting your questions in the chat as well, because I will, um, I will look at them and we'll try and answer some of them. Um, while you were in that breakout room, uh, Paul, people that stayed here, Paul and I had a little conversation and he, he said something that I think is really similar to what I'm hearing from lots of people. So he talked about how his lockdown life, like lots of us, has kind of involved a bit of a slower start to the day, maybe going on walks a bit more often, doing a bit of exercise during the working day. And those of you who've worked with me before will know that for years, that's been the main thing that I prescribe to business owners. Um, you think best about strategy when you're not in your office. That's an example of something that the science tells us really strongly. And we know that. And we often also want our team to, to be less present in the office. But if we're there, if we're the first in and we're the last out, we teach people that that is what we expect from people who are successful. And that means that too often our main job, defining the strategy of the organization, is something that we try and squeeze into our commute or you know, ponder over while we're on a treadmill late at night. Um, so you've probably picked up some really high value strategic habits during this time um, about reflecting, having distance, horizon scanning, that it would be really important for you to try and keep. A um, couple of things that I think everybody at any stage of your business should be doing more of, how much more you do of it depends a lot on your business, is really prioritizing the bit of your job that isn't at your desk. Your job is to think. Um, so find where you think best, and I almost guarantee you it won't be sat in front of a computer. If you've got a team, be out of the office more. Almost every team I've ever worked with asks different questions if they have to pick up a phone than they do if they have to turn a swivel chair around. So practice building an accountable team by getting out of the way and allowing them to do that. Delegate more. So um, I'm, I'm going to try not to look at anybody because there's some people on the call that I know are guilty of this. But if you still do things that you shouldn't, now is a time to delegate as you readjust your business. There are some things that you do every day which are terrible value for money. Not only are you not the best person to do it, but you cannot justify what you pay yourselves for doing that kind of admin. Um, and you all know what those things are, and we all do it when we're having a bad day because it's dead satisfying to color code a spreadsheet. Um, but it's not your job, and I guarantee you can do better things with that time. So now is the time to shift that off your desk if you haven't already. And lots of people have got rid of some of those things actually over lockdown. So don't accept them back. Just you know, put a wall up. Um, really think about how you're going to use technology to build more intimate relationships with your customers. There's quite a lot of evidence that you can develop very, very intense relationships with both staff and customers if you use this kind of technology effectively. Um, there are things that we'll still want to do face to face and there are things that this technology is terrible for, but be really thoughtful and intentional about what needs to be face to face and why and separate out the things that are to do with your wants and needs and the things that are to do with what either your business needs or what your clients need. Um, really, really learn to celebrate not being part of the gang and being dispensable. It hurts like a dagger when you realize you're not part of the gang and that they talk about you behind your back. And maybe they don't, but if we assume that they do and we stop caring about that, then we can really step into a space where we lead, where we are accountable for our decisions and we make space for other people in our business to step into their space. Almost every business owner on this call will have ended up where they are today because somebody got out of the way, let them take up space and let them make mistakes. Um, if you are preventing your team from doing the same, you are holding them back and ultimately that will hold you back. And when I say team, if, if you don't have people that you directly employ, but you have subcontractors that you work with, partners that you work with, all of those other people, the same logic applies. And, and finally, recognize that your team will not do what you say if they see you doing something different. So if what you really want is a business where people make really smart choices about when they're productive, make smart decisions about face-to-face -face versus online, um, be the person that does that. 
don't be the person that sits in the office and expects everybody else to work from home because what they will see is that you value one thing and if they're not that they won't succeed and no amount of telling people something is going to change that if that's what you model um, there's really depressing research that shows that when we give our employees permission to do something we usually have to tell them an average of 37 times before they actually believe that permission and that is if we are doing the thing that we're asking them to do if we're not you're absolutely screwed it's never going to happen so summary version you're the problem stop being the problem everything will be better uh, has anybody got any questions One that I think will be interesting, Isla, I'm, I'm sure people are just preparing theirs, but <clears throat> what about other leaders? Like what kind of category and position do you put them in? So you talk about getting out of the way and not being part of the gang and being okay with that. Does that go, is that, is, is that the same uh, place for like senior managers and leaders in the company other than the business owner? Yes, I think it is. And it, it's, I mean, we will have all learned that lesson somewhere. You know, the, my first, I, one of my first jobs I was like a waitress and then I became the shift manager and suddenly people who had been mates with I had to make decisions about and it was hard I wanted to stay I wanted to be like not that guy and that wasn't an option um, I think we've all learned that lesson I think one of the challenges is when we build a senior management team what what we want to do is keep them really close because it gives us a sense of control and we dress it up as if it's support but actually half of it is spying and about us and so they never see us model the behavior um, something I say that makes me really, really unpopular. If you're the, the founder of a business, you shouldn't be at the Christmas do. Your job is to pitch up, buy everybody a drink, leave your credit card and piss off. Um, and that hurts because, because this is our social life. We spend far too long at work, but there are, there are real compromises. Um, if you know too much about people's lives, you will make worse strategic decisions. Um, and I say that to, I'm a chair and a non-exec. I say that to non-execs all the time. If you've got a non-exec that hangs out with you outside work, they're going to do a worse job than one who politely declines all of your invitations with a smile. That distance is part of how you make great strategic decisions. It's not about being unkind, it's not about being unfriendly, but, but you also can't be friends with people and make great decisions all the time. <laughs> Look at Paul's face there, that wasn't what you wanted to hear. No, was it, Paul? I, I was, I was, no, I was genuinely checking who's still on the call because our non <laughs> was on the call and I was just about to message him to say, I'm revoking your, your, your Christmas party invite, yeah. Yeah, I find that really, I mean, I've worked with boards that I adore. I'd love to hang out with them, but I, I can't make the same decisions. You know, if I know somebody is doing a really crappy job and we need to restructure because they're not getting the outcomes and I also know that they've just split up with their boyfriend, that's too hard. I need to prioritise the business and work out what it needs and then work out what that means the team have to do. And then I might have to take account of some individual differences. We've got a hands up, which is yeah. brilliant. Got a, a, a clap emoji, which is always a good sign. Has anyone got any questions, observations? So I can see Kelly has her hands up, and Dan Kelly, do you want to go first? I think I think she's just clapping. I was oh, just is it clapping? Sorry. You, oh, you're <laughs> clapping. Sorry, that's, a, that's a, I thought that was a wave. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, I will accept your applause. Thank you. Um, does anybody have any other questions? Does anybody want to disagree with me? Because I, you know, I am relatively often wrong. I mean, I'm not. I'm just saying that to be kind. Yeah. It's just something I find an issue with Zoom. It's really awkward at times. <laughs> yeah. like, we do a roundup every day at 5.15. And uh, I feel like I'm this uh, show pony that has to entertain 22 individuals and didn't ask an open-ended question, which will then lead to silence. So I'm saying things that I regret. I've got this window into my personal life that we've now... <laughs> to experience and I am noticing this element of uh, personal um, overlap a little bit you know even when I spoke to Paul recently I saw a picture of a child in the background I was like your little and Paul and you know and it, you are I feel like there is this element of hyper personalization taking place at the moment um, my wife would love to hear what you said about leaving the Christmas doom I'm the last one there I'm the one who's you know high-fiving everybody <laughs> My, my question would be, where do you start with trying to retract really strong bonds? I, I feel at the moment there's an element of ownership from certain individuals that have been with the Cubics for, for four years. And um, there is this awkwardness when you want to have a... I feel like when you've got somebody new in your business, it's really easy to craft what you want. But going to a senior person that's been there for four years is difficult. 
where would you say you should start with that process of um, moving away slightly? I mean, it's one of the reasons I'm talking about it a lot just now is there are some advantages of the fact that we've had this massive disruption. So disruption always makes it easier to make dramatic changes. Um, I would really start by looking at who those people are that you can trust to make the right decisions and get them to do the daily calls, don't you do it? Um, so the, the easiest concept to introduce, I'd say, is for your senior leaders or your emerging leaders to say, right, you've got this, I trust you, we're moving to reporting by exception. So I'm not going to be on those calls. But if you phone me, uh, you know, it, if the call's at five o'clock, if you phone me at 5.30, I will always answer that call and I will trust that you are bringing me into this because this needs my call. Otherwise, I don't want to hear about it. It's nothing to do with me. Um, and that is, that's a, it, it freaks us out. We don't like it. And you will snoop and you'll check things in the background. Just don't get caught. Um, and then start, start with praise. So start saying to people, do you know what? It's been amazing this week. I've not had to intervene in anything. I've not heard from people. Everything's fine. Um, and then the next step is to lengthen the period of time that you can do that for so that you get to the stage eventually. Um, from a lot of the businesses on that call, you get to the stage where um, you can have a monthly update where you say, right, you're responsible for these outcomes. And if it's between this and this, don't tell me. If it's below this, I want to know how you're going to recover it. If it's above this, I want to know what we've done right and whether there's any um, implications from that. Otherwise, carry on, everybody. You're doing a smashing job. No, thank you. I completely agree. I think the only the only hard part that's happened recently during this this whatever you want to call this situation, Corona period, um, we've I find it harder to hide. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, that's that's. I'm not going to be in a in a boardroom meeting at someone else's offices. You know, I feel like there was this um, this figma of imagination. Louie will be in some sort. Of, sometimes I'll just be playing with the kids, and I'll be I'll be you know not really that busy or whatever I might be doing. But whereas now I feel people kind of assume you will be behind a desk, you know, we're not exactly going out to many places at the moment. And I feel that's been the hard part to break. but hopefully with certain places now open, you can have an excuse to be busy. So I think that might be a good piece of advice to, to sort of leverage the current situation that we can now have a bit more movement, can't we? Yeah, but I would also say, like, just, just don't apologise. <laughs> like, if you're, if you're doing your job, let everybody assume you're doing your job. Um, yeah. There might be one person in your business who needs access to your diary to book things in, mm. but not everybody needs to see what you're doing. You don't have to apologize. You don't have to explain where you're going when you leave the office. Um, great phrase that we all need to use more often. If someone says, can you do that? Say, no, I'm sorry, I'm spoken for. And they don't need to know anymore. They don't need to know whether spoken for is really important client pitch or where my pajamas and eating biscuits. Um, I, I assume you're gonna make the right decisions for your business. Um, you need to behave as if everybody else should assume that too. That's going in the follow-up email. No, I'm sorry, I'm spoken for. Got it. I, I'm now like thinking of so many people on this call who I will have used that line for, and I can guarantee that none of them were important pitch making things. It was all the onesies and biscuits one. <laughs> My, mine's just been sorry, I've not, I'm not on my laptop. And it's true because yeah. I just go out wandering around on my phone. Like, oh, sorry, I've not got my laptop. Someone else have to do it. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it's the, <clears> the problem is that we feel guilty. We feel that we owe our employees uh, an explanation of our productivity and that builds a culture that asks them to do the same and then we wonder why we haven't got the level of trust and accountability that we, we want. Um, but yeah, it's, um, it's not easy stuff It's because it's all tied up with our emotion, our sense of worth, our sense of guilt. Like we concentrate so much on the advantages we have in our business and we forget the eight months where we ate nothing but lentils and didn't pay ourselves because we were paying everyone out you know all of that stuff goes doesn't it we just think oh i took 10 minutes off to do the laundry today i'm a terrible person who eats lentils bloody no, love lentils me never got that bad <laughs> <laughs> i'm <coughs> scottish i eat lentils out of choice <laughs> any other questions um if there's any other uh, i can i can follow up via paul Paul mentioned we've got some funding at the moment for people who want support in Greater Manchester. Um, probably just do all the things I said and you don't need it. Um, but I will send the details to Paul and he can circulate them if anybody does want um, somebody to come and shout at them in person. Brilliant. Thanks, Isla. I have recorded this. I'm not sure um, whether I've gone for gallery view or speaker view, but it won't matter, will it? Because we only had one person speaking at a time, really. It'll probably take half an hour or so to convert. I'll put it in a WhatsApp uh, channel straight away and then I'll send a follow-up email tomorrow we'll have uh, Ben's presentation 
we'll have uh, Adam's one pager on putting a financial plan together. Uh, we'll have the recordings of these two sessions. And then please just let us know if there's anything else that we can do, if there's anything we've missed today that you would like to follow up on, if there's any speakers that you've heard before or any topics that you'd love us to speak about next time, then please let us know. But thanks, guys. Great to have such a good turnout considering how zoomed out I'm sure you all are. You, no one needed another webinar yet. Here you all are um, spending time with us. So do appreciate it. It helps some of us feel a little bit less lonely stuck at home. And um, take care. I'll speak to you. Oh, sorry, Mike's told me something. Uh, Mike wants me to announce next month's speakers. Martin Murphy is one Mike, right? And the guys from 4 and 20 million. So uh, Martin is, is leadership and culture stuff. More detail to be confirmed. And 4 and 20 million, uh, really good content. I've been following them for, for a while online um, and speak very well about uh, culture um, as well. So that's something to look forward to next month. Uh, I'll announce the date, time, details in the follow-up email. Is that everything, boss? Yeah, it's giving me a thumbs up. Cool. Okay, everyone, have a lovely evening. See you later.